<laughs> hey, I'm proud of everybody because we had a lead, we relinquished the lead, and we brought ourselves back and won the freaking game. That's a freaking NFL win. <laughs> And welcome back to an episode of the Cooler Jets podcast for us, Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, our second victory pod of the season. Are you re- are you ready for this? Are, are you ready to do another victory pod this early in the year? I'm, I don't even think I can answer that because it's not something that I am experienced with doing. You know, multiple victories in a three-week span. This is foreign territory for us. So we're going to try to navigate these waters as, as best we can because it's, like I said, just something that is not within anything that we are used to doing. No, and in this history of this podcast, I guess this isn't a September win. Technically, it's, it's October, but this is the probably the we, – we started it right before the 2019 season. There weren't any real, mem, you know, really meaningful games. I guess they beat the Cowboys that year. 2020 obviously sucked. And then they had the Titans game last year, and then they had the Browns game this year. But we haven't had very many meaningful football wins to talk about. So every single one is, is a blessing. And this one, Zach's return, uh, you know, mixed bag of a game. You know, definitely like a great start, a uh, tough second and third quarter for this team. Definitely felt like they were going to let it slip away. But the fact that they fought back and came back and won it, their second come from behind victory this season, fifth, if you count preseason, every single win this team has had, including preseason, which I know doesn't count, has it been a fourth quarter comeback, which I think does speak to the to the character of this team. So much to break down on this one. Um, uh, I, I'm going to try not to get as excited because I, I, I listened to last week's pod or like a, our preview pod. And I noticed that I was like the audio game was off because I was like screaming into the mic. So we're going to calm things down today, Michael, even though it's a win. Uh, I, I, there's no organization on this on this on these post game pods. Uh, we don't have much written down. I guess let's start with Zach. There's there's a million different ways we could go with this one. But he seemed like the biggest storyline entering this one. And this was a big moment for him to have this game winning drive. Cause for me, Michael, Zach has all the talent in the world. I mean, when you look at his college tape, it's probably better than any other college tape I've seen from a Jets quarterback, but it was really just the, he's had, he hasn't had the game winning moment. He had, he seemed overwhelmed too many times. You, you, I never had, I haven't had the feeling like, okay, this is the guy. Uh, that many times obviously the titans game gave you a little bit of that and the bucks game but this game michael those last 10 minutes the way the jets won that game that was huge for zach wilson's development and my confidence in him becoming that guy um because the more confident he gets the more you're going to see those flashes of greatness and and uh, with that michael i give it to you what did you think of of zach's performance starting from the very first play all the way through. I know, I know it was a little mixed bag, but he did come back in that second half and, and really, you know, put together a, a nice performance. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. I think that fourth quarter really changed everything for the perception and, and the narrative of this game. Cause I think prior to the, prior to that, you know, the jets were down 20 to 10. They had lost some of their early offensive momentum. He had gotten off to a good start, but then after that couple of picks, you know, second one, you know, maybe not the worst pick in the world, but, you know, the momentum had kind of been lost. So it it was going to be sort of a, you know, mixed bag game. There were some flashes, some mistakes, but that fourth quarter, that's what being a franchise quarterback is all about. Because at the end of the day, simply put, like we come out, we come on here every week and we try and we are very analytical about everything, every little detail about how the game is played and especially quarterback, all of that at the end of the day is to get wins. So, you know, on this day, Things weren't perfect. You know, they had a long, cold stretch. The offensive line was, you know, it's, it's in dire straits right now. It wasn't always the, an ideal situation for him to make plays, but they were given an opportunity at the end to atone for what had happened, to wrong their rights, and he came through. And that's that's how you put together successful seasons. That's how you win games, get to the playoffs, win playoff games, is by being able to come through when you have those opportunities, regardless of – if you had the cleanest game or the most perfect game or the best stats, it's come through when it matters. And 
it's not something he did a ton last year and it's not something the jets have done a ton of throughout you know this long playoff drought that they're in so for him to be able to you know just settle down and not allow things to go down the drain after he went through a little bit of a rough patch was very very promising and you know this is his, his first game back and playing in one of the toughest road environments in the league and, and obviously this is you know not the best version of the Steelers we've seen but it's hey. still yeah playing in Pittsburgh against yeah. Mike Tomlin yeah um you know offensive line issues you know he's still getting used to playing on this knee injury that he's recovering from so a lot of obstacles and this easily could have gone down the drain and been a really tough you know frankly kind of embarrassing loss considering you have another rookie quarterback coming off the bench kind of like Baker Mayfield in 2018 you know leading a comeback so it it easily could have gone down the drain but he came back in that fourth quarter and was so poised so confident in the biggest moments and that gives you a lot of confidence obviously going forward you'd like things to be a little bit cleaner to avoid the turnovers to capitalize more opportunities Um, maybe some of the aggressive chances he took maybe toned down a little bit so there are some things to improve of course but the fact of the matter is when they needed him the most, he came through. And yeah. that's how you succeed in the league. Even when you're not perfect, go make the winning plays when you have to. The Jets have not been good, Michael, um, since that one fateful January afternoon in Pittsburgh, AFC Championship 2010 season. They, they blew that game. And the last 12 years have just been an utter shit show um, for the most part. Uh, do you think this is this is turning a new leaf? I'm just kidding. I, you know, it's it's too early to say that. Michael, we can't we can't be too. You know, on the losses, we're like, all right, let's be measured, everybody. And then on the wins, it's like, all right, we can't be too. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like on the losses, it's like don't worry about them. On the wins, like this is it. This is the turning point <laughs> of this franchise. This is the turning point of the whole franchise. Yeah, you said that the Cowboys um, game. In I'll, I'll say this: we did. Oh God, I well, think I'll we say, did. I don't remember that. Um, I don't remember it. Doesn't count. Um, I'll say this though: you want something that that isn't hyperbole or uh, overreaction. The Jets don't win this game with Joe Flacco at all. Yeah, I definitely think that's fair, and I think because the biggest difference is in I think plays that necessarily you know weren't plays themselves. It's the plays, the negative plays that didn't happen. I think like Zach Wilson got sacked one time in this game. You look at the box score, and, and, he, just, and, he, and he moved up in, in the sack. You know what I mean? Like it was only like a three yard sack. Yeah, yeah, he stepped and up. You look at that and. And that doesn't tell the story at all of how the pass protection was in this game. Like he was, he dodged so many sacks that definitely would have been sacks with Joe Flacco. So um, I, I think it's the mobility and the ability to avoid sacks. That was a big difference in this one. How do you think the, the Ravens and Ben after, I mean, we've only had one game of Zach. So this, this, this question will be probably answered throughout the season, but how different do you think the Ravens and Bengals game would have looked at uh, lo- looked like with Zach at QB? I mean, I feel like we still have to see him a little, a little bit more to get a an idea of who he is this year. Uh, if you got this version of Zach Wilson in those two games. It's a pretty I mean, fair version, up and down, good stuff and bad. Yeah, I don't know. I think I think we have to see him be a, a little more consistent, to kind of be sure that those two games would have gone a whole lot differently. But uh, I don't know. I think it's tough to say right now. Yeah. Do, you, do you currently have any sort of conviction that – those would have been better. Well, I think they probably would have lost again. Pro- I mean, yeah. I think that the Bengals game, I'm a little bit more like, I feel like maybe if they were able to keep, extend plays, the big difference between the two of them, I mean, there's a few of them, obviously mobility and whatever, but it, it's just the simple thing, uh, the simple fact of like Flacco is as good as the play design is. If the play design is going to work, and a lot, uh, sometimes he wasn't even that good. A lot of times he would miss open receivers. But if if the play design and the offensive line held up and the receiver is like he could hit your guy. Um, but if if a left tackle got beat or if a guy didn't get open immediately, like if the play broke down, which happens every single drive multiple times, like uh, the you know the defense is scheming against you, like you know. Um, but when the play breaks down for Zach, he's at least able to make something happen. You know, he can make that guy miss. He can throw it away, like you say, and avoid catastrophe. Or he can make that guy miss, extend, or roll out. And then it's like, hey, you know, Conklin's open. Or I can dump it off the breeze. Or I can take it myself. And and it was keeping the Jets out of a lot of those third and long situations. They were still in them plenty of times today. But the big difference was Flacco is just as good as the play design. Whereas Wilson has the ability to elevate them above the play design with his improvisation and his mobility. I was really impressed. Like you said, with his poise, 
I think that was the thing that I, I think had been lacking from Zach, if we're being honest, in his rookie year, like a lot of time. And you could even say, you know, I think Robbie Sabo um, from Jet Zach's Factor, he had a tweet in the middle of the game where he was like, you know, the thing with Zach is he definitely has a switch where it's like he's playing great until blank happens. And then he, you know, it, it's hard for him to rebound or he's playing poorly uh, or like, sorry, like, you know, he has that great game against Carolina. Belichick gets after him week two and that definitely flustered him for the next two games. And then, you know, and then he has the Titans game. And he's back. You're like, he has these moments where it seems like he, he, it's hard for him to fight against momentum. Like if he's feeling himself, it's going really well. And then one bad thing happens and, and he, we hadn't really seen him too often. I mean, how, how many times last year did we see him, come back after adversity right like pretty much never and i, I don't think, think that's a great point like that's why this game is so impressive because i think last year zach once things start to spiral i think started starting with that first interception at the end of the second quarter i think that would have just been the rest of the game like he wouldn't have had that fourth quarter so i think to see him kind of for the first time fight against that kind of switch tendency like on switch off switch and kind of be able to get out of that and bounce back is what makes this a, a performance to be excited about in spite of some of the inconsistency. And I think the accuracy too, there was like a few plays where like, I know he had the, the one where he threw it to Garrett and that could have been intercepted. That was behind him. He had the Brees Hall wheel route where he rolled out. And if he just was able to set his feet and launch that, that was a 90 yard TD and said it's, it's broken up. He had a few plays, but when the moment counted, when the game came down to the wire, last 10 minutes, some of the throws that he made, especially the one to Corey Davis, who was sliding and he put it like just on the right shoulder, like he made some next level NFL throws. And it was the Zach Wilson that we saw at BYU. And even like the stuff that isn't like Mahomesian, like he had that first big, big play to Elijah Moore where he stood in the pocket and he fired it to the sideline and Moore like made a guy miss and tried to cut it back or whatever. Like that play, like, you know, is that showing up on sports under top 10? No, but that play, we didn't see that much from Zach stay in the pocket, stay poised, fire that on a rope to the sideline, like throw with anticipation. We didn't get that that much from Zach. And we saw a few of those today. We saw uh, honestly a number of them. And that's why I feel so optimistic. I shouldn't say so optimistic about, about the rest of the season. Cause like you said, Michael, like, you know, up and down performance, it's obviously some good, but we have to see more of him throughout the season to really get a sense of, you know, like, cause like Darnold came back from Mono, he had an amazing game against the Cowboys and then he had the worst game I've ever seen against the Pats the next week. So it's, it's up and down for a young quarterback, but I think the traits that Zach displayed today, the reason it's so it's a big deal to me is because they're traits that we just didn't see last year. And they're, they're honestly, the Jets aren't getting anywhere if Zach doesn't have them. If Zach doesn't have that poise and that clutch ability and that ability to play with the short-term memory and, and respond against adversity and come up in the big moments, like that's when you become the Kirk Cousins. Or what, Obviously, athletically, they're very different. But you want to be a Brady or a Mahomes or a Josh Allen or a Lamar Jet. You want to be in that upper echelon? Go and win games like these. You know? And and I honestly, I have to say, I just I was very impressed with him. I was uh, – a his mobility was great, but you know, he had that one like throwaway where he got like tossed yeah. up, it's, he like, spun around and got tossed up in the air. And then they showed the replay and he, he landed with his leg all bent back. And I was like, Oh Jesus oh, Christ. God. <laughs> but like, uh, so there's a little bit of that still where I'm like, ah, like I'm holding my breath every, every play. But, um, but this did a lot for, for me and in, in my perception of, of Zach as a player. And I think the confidence that this will give him will really uh, radiate in his performances uh, or, you know, throughout the season. Um, I want to stay on Zach for a little bit more and then we, we can move on. Uh, specifically, what were some of the things that you saw that he was doing? I know we've talked to touch on a few of them, but some of the things that you saw that he was doing, uh, that really stood out to you in a, in a good way. And then maybe some of the things that you saw that were maybe a little concerning where you want to see Zach grow and, and get better. Obviously it's a lot easier to learn from a win than a loss, but, uh, yeah, diving into the details. What did you see from Zach? Well, I, I think positively to go off what you just said. Uh, even when there were those moments where he was, you know, playing backyard football, just kind of running around, dodging pressure. I feel like he, despite doing that, had a good sense of knowing where he was on the field and what his odds were of extending the play and knowing when it was time to throw the ball away. As, as long as he was holding it at times, at the end of the day, he only got sacked once and he did a great job of throwing it away when it was time to. So I think if he can continue to master that, you know, be able to 
ex- have these crazy play extending scrambles that other quarterbacks can't make while not sacrificing sacks and putting himself in danger while doing that. I think it, you know, that's how he's going to be able to get the most out of his ability to make these plays outside of structure, because those only go so far if you have to pay, you know, sacks and getting yourself hit and making bad decisions to make one of those plays every now and then you have to be able to, to know when to throw the ball away. I think that's part of why Aaron Rodgers is so good. You see, like he leads the league in throwaways pretty much every single year because he's able to evade the pressure really well, but he only takes chances when they make sense. And he has a really good feel for where the pressure is, how much time he has and when to get rid of that ball. And I think in this game, we saw a a good feel for that. There were some close calls, but for the most part, I think, uh, he did a good job of that. Um, on the negative side, I guess, well, first of all, it all starts with that interception in the first half. That was definitely one that he would like to have back, you know, throw that, especially considering you're in field goal range that you probably don't want to try. And, and uh, guess who was wide open? Garrett Wilson was wide open <laughs> over the middle on that play. Um, so, yeah, that one was one you'd like to have back. And I guess just some of the deep throws, some of them when he was outside the pocket too, like you mentioned the one. To Brees Hall, there's definitely a window there. Um, tough throw, but one he can make. Definitely not as tough as, you know, the Titans throws he made, so he's capable of it. Um, so he did miss on a few of those. Maybe they're – and I'm going to have to watch it again, but I also think on that Hall play, I think it was Uzama who's wide open, kind of a few yards more shallow than him. I, I'd have to rewatch it. but um, there, there was there was a tight end when he was rolling out where it was like, okay, you could dump it off to him for a few yards. And I was like, oh, well, he could just run it for a few yards. And I was like, oh, he's going to bomb it deep. He's wide up from Brees. And then it was like complete. So it's like – Yeah. So I guess like the deep accuracy wasn't great. No. Um, honestly, a lot of this you really have to rewatch it before you you truly know. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess overall it's just kind of, kind of shaky at the accuracy. There were some close calls, especially on the deeper throws. The interception wasn't good. Um, but the first one. I, I, I like the – yeah, the first – the second one. I mean, Conklin. that's Conklin. It, Come on. It's not an ideal throw, but you should catch that ball at least, what, 80% of the time. Yeah. And and even if you don't, it's just unlucky that's that it's an interception. Like, he missed it. You know, it wasn't the best throw, but it shouldn't be a pick. You know, it's not, it's not like an interception-worthy throw like the yeah. first one was. So it is a mixed bag in the middle of the game there, but uh, start of the game was great. The close was great. In between there – uh, kind of struggled to find his footing but uh overall the way he finished has to have you feeling optimistic and even when he was struggling to find his footing it it, it, just, it did feel different I could you could just sense his feel of the he was comfortable in the offense you know like I felt like that was very apparent that he didn't look like his head was spinning on every single play which we haven't really seen from a from a Jets court I mean like towards the end of last year you definitely got that from Zach like post injury he seemed a lot more comfortable with the playbook and 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 setting the protections and the routes the receivers are running like having to hold all that information in your head every single play especially you know Zach's a guy who has ADHD like I I have ADHD a lot of people have ADHD you're wondering it's like well is he able to even kind of maintain all that information in his head in an NFL stadium with all these fans like and he came back from the injury last year and he seemed a lot calmer in his head he seemed like he uh was able to calm his mind down and settle down. And then today, like, like you said, like he had some rough moments, but he was able to just, he just seemed in charge. He seemed in control. Even when he had some bad passes, it didn't seem like the Sam Darnold seeing ghost game or the Zach Wilson last year against the Pats, where it was just like, um, you know, things are really spiraling out of control. Granted, it's worth mentioning. It's a better team. The jets are able to run the ball a little bit more. Receivers are getting open easier. Guys are holding up their blocks a lot more. Um, so it's, it's a lot different. The jets are finally able to help out their young quarterback, which I think is a big thing you saw in this one. But at the same time, this young quarterback went out and won this game and they played complimentary for football for the first time this season. This is really the first win, Michael, that, because even going back to the Browns game, like obviously the Browns game was magical, but it was a sense of like, okay, they totally shouldn't have won that game. Like the Browns could have just kneeled it and won. Um, this was the first real I don't know, like regular season, they won it, meaningful, get to 500, Zach's undefeated on the year. Like this was a really massive win for this team, man. And I, I don't think you can under, understate it enough. Like entering this one, I, I texted you like five minutes before the game. I was like, oh boy, here we go. This is a big one. Because they lose it and you're one and three and then you got a really tough stretch upcoming. And 
you know, it's, it's probably another one of those types of years of last year. Maybe, you know, maybe they have a better second half and they can get to six or seven wins, but it's a different type of season. The fact that they got to two and two, and we'll see how they, they, they play over this next five games before the bye. If they can get one or two of the, the, these games as wins, I think that's, they're in a great spot. They're four and five. Um, but they're playing competitive football, Michael. They're finally back kind of in the thing, you know, like we'll see, we'll see how things go and how the rest of the season goes. Just like you could start zero and four and finish 13 and four, but it feels like, okay, for the first, through the first four games, the AFC North gauntlet that we talked about for months, they came out of it 500 and even the two losses. Yeah. Like they weren't pretty, but there were moments in those games where you saw the jets were competing and could have won those games. Um, I don't know. Like I, it, I'm, I'm feeling really good about the state of this team and in this win in particular was just so crucial for a young team to put that together. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a fun young team. Like I, I had that, that tweet last week. I was like, you know, it's a fun young team. They're going to win some, they're lose some. And everybody's like a fun team. They're sucking at like, you know, they're getting all mad, but it's like the fact that the jets have players like sauce Gardner and Brees hall and Garrett Wilson and Elijah Moore and, you know, you could go down the line, all these fun young players that are Jermaine Johnson's getting sacks and, and Elijah Vera Tucker is playing left tackle for the first time in his NFL career and balling out. Like they, Joe, the finally they're starting to see the fruits of all these Joe Douglas draft picks. And that's exciting. And that's fun. So even if the jets only win seven or eight games this year, if they have more games like this, where the young guys come together and they, they make plays and they win it and they fight through adversity. You can feel really good about the change in this organization. Whereas the last few years, you know, there, like last year, there were some signs of, of development, but you still were like, they're still picking number four in the draft, you know? And whereas I feel like this is a, a really good sign for, for the direction of this team. Now we'll see how, how the rest of the season plays out. But speaking of ABT, Michael, and if there's anything else you want to touch on Wilson, I'm sure he'll come up again. Feel free to obviously. actually real quick before we get to ABT, I want to kind of expand yeah, on what you said. Um, because I, I know there's kind of like a hesitancy right now to kind of feel optimistic about the team, considering you know how close their two wins were. You know, Browns was a miracle, Steelers comeback win against a team that might not prove to be that great this year. And then the other two losses were, you know, not blowouts, but they weren't close. So I know there's kind of that feeling, but I think that is what is optimistic. The fact that they did win those games, because at the end of the day, if you're going to win a Super Bowl, if you're going to win playoff games, if you're going to get to the playoffs, you have to win games like that. You're not going to dominate and look super clean every single week. You have to be able to find ways to win. And the Jets have never done that throughout this, this playoff drought, except 2015, obviously. Other than that, like they don't win these games. The only time the Jets would win games in recent years is when they come out and you're like, all right, everything's clicking. And then they would still only and th- this game felt like that. This game felt like that. And then when it started to slip away, I was like, oh, these are the worst losses. Right, exactly. Like, these, are, you- <laughs> these are the games that they lose and you have to be able to win when you don't play your best. And granted, the Jets do have to improve and play sharper if they're going to win games this year and be a winning team going forward because you're not going to win every single game like this. And you have to be sharper if you're going to be consistent. But if you are going to get the wins you need to be competitive, you have to be able to come out on the better end of these games more often than not. And right now they're doing that. So hopefully, you know, ideally they do, they do play better football going forward. And this right now is, you know, just the beginning and they stole two wins when they're not even playing their best. And then you do play better and you get more consistent, but winning games like this, you should feel optimistic about regardless of the overall evaluation, you know, is this part of the team playing well, you know, right now we're still getting, you know, our net points isn't great right now, or we got blown out twice, one, two close not games. Not blow- you know. blowouts. Come on, Michael. Not blowouts. Well, yeah, like I said, they weren't blowouts, but again, not close games. But however I've been you want to plenty of blowouts. I've, I've how, seen however you want to label it. It's, you know, regardless of that, like they're finding ways to win. And that is the name of the game. And it's something the Jets haven't been able to do. So more improvement is needed if they're going to get over the top, obviously, but this is a team that really and like you mentioned going back to the preseason not that that matters but you just look at the fight this team has been showing like every year we criticize like do they care like does this team really you know want to win games but this team clearly clearly does and I think there are special things happening when you win games like this 
Well, they put a, a large emphasis on bringing in high character guys. And as Joe Douglas said, guys who hate to, to lose more than they love to win. And you're seeing that. I mean, you go watch the pregame speeches or the postgame speeches, like you said, every single guy in that locker room cares, which I know that sounds like that should really, that should be like obvious, but considering we've seen Sheldon, uh, Sheldon Richardson, like <laughs> going live on, on, or putting on a Snapchat story, like fuck this game where the hose at <laughs> or whatever, like 10 minutes before kickoff. Do you remember that? You remember that, Michael? No? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've had a few of those players <laughs> where it's like, all right, this guy's just cashing his paycheck. And you don't get that sense. Everybody, I mean, Salah looks like he's aged five years in the last three weeks. And every single player, you can just see every loss they wear and every win is just ecstatic for them. And that's a, that's a great feeling because that's how I, th- I know, Michael, I know that's how you take every loss <laughs> and every win. I, I've, I've, to, I've had to ban Michael from texting me during the games because he just we, gets we so We don't need to negative. discuss that. No, I'm a very I, optimistic fan. <laughs> Let's just say no. that. Hey, you, and here's the thing. Michael, is you're right about some of the stuff you say during the game, but I'm just so fragile during these games. I'm like, can I just enjoy them? Like, let me just, let me just. No, I think we actually should touch on, touch on a little bit. Cause I think if I put it out there, it'll kind of help me make the improvements yeah. I need to make. So I don't know, like I'm definitely an optimistic fan in general. I think that comes across in some of my coverage, my writing and how we talk about it on here, but on game days, I am just <laughs> as reactionary as it gets. Like every single play is like, you're like, you're oh, like, I'm done with Zach Wilson. It's like, <laughs> I don't even know. Well, you're not some like the things that I say bad. in this game. You're not that. Yeah, bad. I, yeah. I never said that. Yeah. That's no, for sure. You're just but, like, uh, yeah. what was one thing? Like I, I think before halftime, like I sent you his box score stats and put like a puking emoji. <laughs> yeah. I was like, dude, can you just wait until the end of the game? Um, you know, it's a, it's a good formula. I just think that, you know, I think going into halftime when the jets were leading 10 to six, not something that the jets do very often. I was like atrocious. I'm not yeah. happy about <laughs> anything except a few sacks. I think that, uh, I think there's probably a few fans that feel the same way as me. Like I, I, I was just saying this to you before the pod, but like, uh, that 2020 season, I did, I do think kind of changed the way I watch them a little bit because we kind of just got comfortable with them losing. And, uh, not that you're like, comfortable with them losing this year but it's at least like all right like i'm just gonna try to enjoy the game i'm not gonna act like a loss is the end of my existence <laughs> like after yeah. i had i was telling michael like kind of the breaking point for me as a jets fan like look i still get pissed like if they lose a big game i'm gonna get angry but i think i've i've, I've undergone some some uh some growth as a fan not like freaking out because like the, the 2019 season they lost to the Bengals, like a completely meaningless game but if you remember they had won three in a row and it was like all right well if they win this then maybe they can make a playoff push or whatever and it was like a random like third and 20 in like the third quarter or something and they threw it to Le'Veon Bell, or they know it was a draw. They handed it off to Le'Veon Bell. I was like, what the fuck? And then, then he runs and he gets it. I was like, yes, let's go. And then I call it back. It was like holding. Uh, Freaking, I forget who it was, like Greg Van Roten or somebody. And, or I don't think they even had him. It was like Alex Lewis or something. And I was just, and I, I was just so pissed. And I was in the kitchen. I grabbed, there was just an apple on the table. I grabbed it. I threw it across the room and it shattered this, like, this glass hutch in our family room and my parents like what the fuck is wrong like they got I, you know it was a big deal and i just feel like since that moment i was like uh, i just had to come to terms with like why am i freaking out about a terrible football team coached by adam gase like you know so now it's like we've gotten to this point i'm happy with with some of the young players like let's just enjoy the games you know like we we have a whole week for for reactions um yeah no i'm, tr- I'm trying to get to your level because i understand the lack of control that I th- that's the biggest thing i think as a fan you don't control what happens and it's not like complaining and making suggestions during the game like this is unacceptable they need to be better <laughs> it's not like that's gonna yes yeah, so you're in here so it's like if i scream it loud enough maybe he'll hear it and make suggestions or make changes based on what i suggest so i'm trying i'm trying to get to your point where it's like like obviously i'm not going to be like happy go lucky after hey, every so, so single was, bad play yeah where it's like all right guys we'll get out of this it's like hey, that's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah not that, not that i'm gonna try to be like that like yeah I you don't be delusional but but it's like yeah. i need to stop like having existential crises <laughs> when I, when I'm, during the games when you know it's 2010 like why do i root for this team every single week i put up with this and then 10 minutes later i have my reactions recorded and i'm playing for you where i'm like let's go so it's like yeah. yeah, I just got to find some better game day balance. Uh, that's all right. I think most Jets fans feel you on that one. 
All right, let's let's talk about AVT because I think that he I almost opened with AVT over Zach because to me that was the biggest storyline of this one. More so than Zach, honestly. Because entering the week and obviously we still got to see McDermott when Max Mitchell went down, which by the way, if Max Mitchell went down and McDermott was already playing left tackle and then they had to throw like who the fuck were they? It was, it, who's the guy? Uh, 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 Grant Hermans? Who did Hermans or was uh, Obwehi? Was he active or was he? Obwehi. I think he was inactive. God knows what they would have done. But um, I uh, let's just go back to the decision, first of all. I so, I'm so i almost kind of bummed that I didn't mention it on the pod because the thought occurred to me. I didn't really think they would do it, but I was like, not at left tackle. I was like, oh, I wonder, like AVT has tackle experience, like. You know, in an emergency, I guess he would be the guy they would probably flex out there. And I kind of do wonder how he would look because some people in the draft are like, okay, he's probably going to be better at guard, but this is a guy that could be an NFL tackle. Like, if you remember, like, there's some teams that were like, if they drafted him, maybe they would have tried him out of tackle first. Um, but the Jets made him an automatic guard. I have to commend that decision. And not just the decision, um, but the fact that they kept it so under wraps to the point where nobody even right. knew until yeah. the Jets were on the field, in the, not even pregame. Like, because pregame, they, they do their little warm ups and they're, they're in, you know, like, and so sometimes you can get a sense of what the starting unit's going to look like. I don't know what was happening. Maybe nobody was paying attention. Maybe they didn't really do that. Maybe they fool, faked them out and had McDermott there, but who knows? But the fact that it, it was literally a secret all the way until when Zach Wilson was under center on the field, ready to take a snap is impressive. I like the outside the box thinking because it clearly was the right move. Your guard depth with Nate Herbig is significantly better than your tackle depth. AVT balled the fuck out. He might actually be the Jets' best player, Michael. Do you agree with that? Do you think he – I mean, if Dwayne Brown comes back this week, which we think he might, we'll see. You know, we'll talk about Max Mitchell's injury a little bit. But if Dwayne, if Mitchell's out for a while, we know Fant's going to be out for the next few weeks. If Dwayne Brown's eligible to come back. If he comes back, Brown will probably slide back into left tackle, but then you're like, all right, I guess AVT should play right tackle, which means AVT in his first, what, like 20 career games, something like that, 20 something career games, he will have played four of the five positions in the offensive line. And if he plays well at right tackle, he's generational. I don't care. I mean, he, he straight up should be a pro bowler. I don't care because how many offensive linemen, Michael, can you think of that could play four Hell, I, I don't I don't doubt you could put AVT at center. How many offensive linemen do you think you could put all five positions and ball out? Not many, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Midweek, too. Midweek, going from right guard, you're switching sides, and you're switching positions. Just the double whammy. Like, I, I was so unbelievably impressed with AVT. When you talk about seeing the returns in the Douglas draft classes, that guy, Douglas, the O-line guru, he gets a lot of a lot of heat for for the Becton pick, but between Max Mitchell in the fourth round this past year, who's who's played pretty well, but more significantly AVT coming through and playing as well as he did and securing Zach's blindside, that was absolutely massive. Yeah, that was, and the biggest thing that um, which is the first point you mentioned, I think it's really cool that they kept that under wraps. I think you know this is a coaching staff that's been maligned, you know, over the past week and you know over the course of the season, but that right there is the type of big time coaching that I want to see. I, I think that's such an advantage to do something like that, because think about that. Like ABT obviously was planning for this and he studied up on Pittsburgh's edge rushers and got ready for that. But those guys had no idea they'd be going up against ABT. So all of those edge guys probably did not study his film much at all No, and get ready for his tendencies for his play style. So it was completely new to them when he went out there and then same goes for now you've heard big at guard and, and I don't know how he played granted it might not have been well you can't really see on the broadcast but it there was pressure coming from somewhere it might have been from him but still you know he's starting no one on the interior of that Pittsburgh D-line was preparing for him so that that kind of that's the type of coaching move I want to see just keeping yeah. that under wraps no need to come out here and tell everybody everything that's going on just keep it quiet you know handle your business and then come out there and you have an advantage so i think it was cool they did that and, and then yeah i do think he has a case to be their if not best player and i think he does have a case to be their best for sure because he's been that good this year i just think there's some competition with how good quinnon's playing dj reed garrett wilson sauce gardner but he's definitely their most valuable i think once you have this game in there 
for his ability to to that's such a hard thing to do to switch from right guard to left tackle in one week Dif- you know not only different side of the line but different position entirely it's completely different footwork completely different type of players you're playing hasn't against. done it since college hasn't done it since the 2020 season different you know roles in on each play that you have to handle it's not just like okay i'm on left side right side but you know now you're a tackle these are completely different assignments you have to take on it is a very hard thing to do and he came out there and and you know granted we'll watch the film like we say that disclaimer for everything but it clearly seemed like he was having a, a very good game in pass protection and in the run game I think, you know, obviously there are problems in this game with O-line, but I think the majority of them, if not all, were courtesy of someone other than him. So he was very good, and I'm interested to see how he holds up a tackle if he continues to play there, which which it seems like he will. Um, because, you know, I think the knock on him at tackle was the arm length, and he does have very short arms for an NFL tackle. I think he's 31 and a half inches, which is not where you want to be. So that was the, the knock, but he's still just so athletic and so skilled that at least in this game, you could see that he's capable uh, of he's at 32 and one eighth. That's his arm. Like still pretty short. Um, but yeah, like in this game, even d- despite that, he was just athletic and skilled enough to still make plays and execute his role at a high level in spite of that. So we'll see over the long run if that gets exploited by, you know, maybe longer, more physical defensive ends because the Steelers don't really have those. They've speedier outside linebackers. So maybe that will get challenged by, uh, you know, teams that have, which I think Miami definitely does with guys like Emmanuel Agba. Um, maybe that'll be a problem for him, but at least in this game, it was great. And to, to have a guy who could, you know, switch from guard to tackle for you in an emergency situation is that is, there are very few offensive linemen in the okay. league and also- do it to the level he did in this game. I know he has the short-ish arms for a tackle, but you definitely saw his athleticism um, on some of those plays. And like you said, we got to go back and watch because I, I'm, in, I'm curious to see how Lakin played because he's a guy where it was like, all right, well, he was really, really good playing next to Trent Williams. And then he's come to New York and he's had just, you know, no consistency next to him. And uh, so I was, I was curious, like, you know, how much of his performance is just being impacted by the poor left tackle play. But if AVT had a good left tackle performance, I'm very curious to see how Lakin responded. Because if Lakin then had a good game, I noticed they were really making an effort to run left behind the two of them um, quite a bit this game. Um, so, yeah, like you said, we got to go back and watch him. But the question, my question to you, Michael, about AVT is if, because I think if it, regard, I think, I think he's playing tackle again next week, right? Because even if Dwayne's back, it's Max Mitchell's in crutches after the game and, and George Fan is out for the next few weeks. Obviously, Becton's on IR. Um, I, I mean, I know they brought in Mike Remmers and, and Boyhe, but doesn't it kind of seem like he'll probably play tackle again? And if he's playing right tackle next week, if, if like, if Brown comes back and he's playing right tackle or if Brown doesn't come back, he's playing left tackle and they put somebody at right tackle uh, and he plays well again. And he keep you know, has a few good weeks here. Tackle is probably more valuable than guard, right? Do you, do you think there's? Do you think there'll be a push to be like, all right, maybe AVT is a starting tackle for us instead of a guard? Like, obviously, you'll always value that versatility and you can do whatever. But, and that, that's great, obviously, with the uncertainty behind Becton too. Like having a guy that you were confident could be a great tackle or a great guard. But, do you think that if, if AVT puts together a nice stretch here of, of of good tackle performances, that it'll almost be like, and maybe not even from the Jets side, maybe AVT will be like, hey, like tackles get paid more. I'm just curious how that storyline will play out. Do you think there's any chance that AVT does become a tackle? Because if you remember, last thing, if you remember when they drafted him, we did say, you know, he's a guy that maybe he's the – he played play him at guard this year, but if he plays really well, maybe he's the right tackle of the future. Do you remember, we said that on the draft pod. We like maybe you could bounce him out if he proves that he can do it right. because a tackle is more valuable. Um, and while Seth Walder isn't right about uh, the, the trade-up being <laughs> the worst trade in the draft or – whatever, yeah, the forced trade in the NFL history, whatever he said, which I'm, I'm so glad that we all get to dunk on him collectively every week. Um, but, yeah, what do you think about the the potential AVT moving to tackle? Is it too early for that discussion? I mean, the, the musical chairs on the O-line is going to be really interesting uh, because, you know, obviously he, come, he comes out in this game and he shows you that it's a legitimate possibility that he can go over there and play well. And, and granted, you would like to – you know, see it over multiple games because, you know, he has a body of work at guard now versus tackle, you know, one good game, but you want to see it chained together. Um, 
I don't know. It will be interesting to see because they did sign, you know, the two you know, pretty viable reinforcements with Remmers and away. He, so, you know, those are two guys who I think probably trust more at tackle than McDermott. And I mean, I don't know. I, I wonder if maybe they consider starting both of those guys, probably not, but um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how it pans out. Dwayne Brown's health is a big part of it. You know, is he going to be ready this week? Um, I don't know. I feel like I lean towards guard because I just think it's a better fit for him. I think that arm length is going to show up at some point. Um, Cause I do think, like I said, I think this was a good matchup for him to kind of work around that because, you know, speedier outside linebackers, not as long. Uh, he can use his athleticism to match them, but I think maybe bigger, longer and stronger guys will be able to, you know, get that first contact on him and create some push. Um, like I said, especially in Miami next week, I think they have some bigger DNs who can do that. Um, so I don't know. I'm not totally sold on it yet just because I love how well he's played at guard this year. He was playing at, you know, first three games, legitimately a top, I'd say top five left or a right guard kind of level. I really think he was playing at that type of type of caliber. So I, I'm, I like how he's played at guard and I don't want to mess with it unless I'm totally sure that he's going to be a good tackle. Did uh did you know if McDermott allowed a sack? I think the, I think our bet is off because he didn't start at left tackle. So I'd said that if, if the Jets win and McDermott didn't allow a sack, I'd buy his jersey. But That's that was true. so you're that was, hook. But that was under the assumption that he started at left tackle for them. He did have to come in after the Max Mitchell injury. I'm sure he looked terrible. But right. Also, quickly, I think did what was the prediction I made on the interception? Did I say Joiner? I feel like. I know you said, I, you said you did say Carter the second. I remember that. I feel like you right. thrown out Joiner as well, but you did get both Joiner and Carter the second picks. I said I think no. I said maybe Joiner, but I didn't go with it. You also I, threw out Whitehead. I did say Carter too. though. You also I think threw, I don't, I did. I you did. did. You didn't say he would get the pick. You're like, oh, maybe Whitehead, or you were thinking. And then I tried to go two Galaxy Brand, and I went with CJ Mosley, but he was close in one play. He, he was right there on one play, but he allowed the, the completion. And then I got to say, can the Jets, can we get our act together on the whole breeze chant when he gets the ball? Because the Steelers have that shit down when Friar Muth catches the pass. They yeah. just Muth <laughs> every time. It's like, can we and get that, that, is, that is much more ambitious than I think than Brees. Yeah, like, Muth from Friar yeah. Muth? Like, yeah. that, I don't know. So, yeah, the, we got to get our act together on that. Um, all right, so I thought O-line in general, like you got to go back and watch it, but ABT definitely deserves a gold star um, for his performance this week. The receivers, you know what? Let's just lump all the weapons in as one thing. Otherwise, this podcast is going to take three hours. The enti- the, the weaponry for, for Zach, a lot of good. A lot of good all year from, the, from these guys. Um, let's start with Elijah Moore, who I think that, uh, you know, he's – he hasn't really had scrutiny, honestly. It's, it's The scrutiny's more been on the Jets for not giving him the ball because I think every beat reporter that has been at the practices has seen Elijah Moore for the last two years, and they know he's a good player. So they're not re- there hasn't been much focus on on Moore himself of, like, what is he doing wrong? It's been – the Jets got to get Elijah Moore the ball. And I think you definitely saw a concerted effort from Zach early on in the game to really get him involved. And he had that, that, that first – I don't know, was that the touchdown drive? We had those two completions to him, but you, it was like the first time yeah, we got to yeah. see like Elijah Moore in open space with the ball in his hands. I felt like, I feel like we haven't had too many times where it's like, Oh, Elijah caught a ball in stride and he's got, you know, some room to work with. Like every single time we've seen Elijah catch a ball this year, it's been like, you know, possession caught right at the, you know, like a 15 yard catch, but he tacklers right around him every time. And this is the first time it's like, Oh, he's getting, you know, you're not going to play him in the slot, I guess. They're, they're, they're sticking with Garrett in the slot, which is fine, I guess. You think uh, you want to try Elijah out at, at, at X, which which he definitely can do, but he needs to have those yak opportunities. And uh, it was cool to see him get some of those. So what are your thoughts on Elijah and then any of the other guys that, that really popped out to you? Yeah, it was cool to see him get the ball in space a few times. You know, he made some people miss. He saw his speed. And those are things we don't get to see a, a ton from him. So I think there's... You know, there's capability for the Jets to get him some more of those opportunity opportunities because he can be a really good yak playmaker. Uh, and most of the time he doesn't get very – his catches aren't very conducive for yak. You know, he gets a lot of curls, outs, things like that, which he's great at and he can win on, but they don't allow him to be the playmaker that he is. So um, you don't want to take those things out of his game because, like I said, he's good at separating on those, but you do want to get him some more catches over the middle so he can do what he does with the ball in his hands. Um, 
in addition to him, I think there's a lot to talk about with some of these weapons. Corey Davis had a, a big game, five of seven for 74 and the touchdown. Um, and the thing with Davis this year is the catches he's made have been quality catches, like, he's you know, contested balls <laughs> up in the air, over the middle, down low, diving. Uh, he's had clutch touchdowns in this game. And obviously, the play against Cleveland, which, you know, granted it was wide open, but he executed his role and did what he needed to do to make that happen. Um, but, but overall, uh, Ravens game obviously wasn't necessarily close at the end, but he had some great catches in that one. So he's been, I think Corey Davis this year has been what you signed him to be. Um, the drops are down. He's making those contested catches again. And he, he's been that big body target, that clutch target that they need him to be. So Really impressive game from Corey Davis. Um, Garrett Wilson had his quietest game so far, but I think we're going to turn on the tape again and see some more plays where he could have been hit. But granted, I do think it was probably his quietest game in terms of winning. And I think, he, yeah, he had that one drop where he was hit over the middle. Uh, so there's that. But the play he made uh, in the fourth quarter, the big catch and run, was that was a fantastic play with some of his elusiveness after the catch. Um, and then Tyler Conklin is an interesting subject here because they're like Conklin overall, I still think is playing pretty good. Like he's made like Davis, he's made some really nice contested catches. He's had some good catch and runs the past few games. And there is even some subtle impact with him, you know, such as on Davis's touchdown where Conklin has a great rub to get Davis open. Conklin has done a lot of that this year in combo routes to open people up on Garrett Wilson's game winner against Cleveland. Conklin's timing to hold the linebacker was great to get the, uh, Garrett Wilson open. So over, and I think Conklin's block, blocking has been good. So overall, he's playing pretty good and just what you expected him to do. But the hands just have not been what you've typically expected from him. Um, you know, the second interception, that's on Conklin. It's not a great throw. You know, Zach Wilson could throw that more accurately, but. It hits two hands. You're a tight end. You got to catch that ball. Yeah, he's so had a few too many drops. It's it's a little disappointing how drop prone he's been, considering he had one drop last year. I think he's at three now with this one and two fumbles versus having, I'm pretty sure, won his entire career coming into this season. Um, granted, that's unlikely to continue, but the drops are concerning with him. But it is exciting that other than the drops, I think he's been very solid so once he gets that figured out i think fans will come to appreciate conklin as a, easily this team's best tight end since dustin keller and not a high bar to clear but he's playing <laughs> outside of the drops hey and it drops matter but outside of the drops it, he's been really solid i think hey dustin keller that's the og right there oh yeah and, i'm uh, saying you know in terms low of bar guys, guys since him i'm saying yeah okay yeah yeah that's yeah, that's yeah. a that's not even a bar that's yeah underground um I think that, uh, like you said, Corey Davis was – this was a special game for him. I think he had – the Titans game last year was was obviously a great game because he had – honestly, just because he got that, that big touchdown or whatever. Uh, and I think he had a few other nice plays. But this, to me, was the – the biggest game of, of Corey Davis's Jets career, just some of the catches that he made. And like you said, he's had actually a number of them. I know he had the bad drop to open up uh, the season against the Ravens. And then he had the bad penalty last week, which was dumb. And he had another bad penalty today. Um, but he's had a really good off season. I mean, through training camp, he's popped up consistently about the plays that he's made and he's made plays in pretty much every single game. And some of these really, really tough catches over the middle, having to dive for them or, or jump up for them and take a big shot. And that's what you mean when you say like, we need a big physical receiver. It's not like, you know, today's NFL and especially in this jets offense, it's not like they're asking Corey Davis to like box out a corner that much or like use his physicality. It's like go over the middle and get smacked and get up. <laughs> that's yeah. what it means to have a big physical receiver for this offense. And, and Corey's doing it, man. And uh, I think he definitely deserves uh, a lot of praise. Garrett again, uh, open. <laughs> it's like every play uh, had a really nice play in the fourth quarter that really got the, the, the ball moving on that, on that one drive. Uh, Elijah, like we said, I think finally we started to see him get involved. Uh, I'm just so excited to see Zach with all these weapons, man. The fact that they knock him wood, they all, Michael, knock him wood. Right. There Heard we go. that? Heard right. it. Um, <laughs> the fact that they've they've stayed healthy for him too, and they, so he's come back and he gets to have kind of the full arsenal. Um, 
Brees is really starting to get going. Like every week, it seems like he's getting better. And this week, again, he seems great. Or, you know, he's he's getting more comfortable. He's breaking more tackles. His vision's getting better. I mean, like Brees is really starting to come on to the point where I think he had, I have to go look at the box score real quickly, but but I think Carter only had like eight carries. And I think Brees yeah, had 17 20. to nine for Hall. Seven, yeah, 17 to nine. Um, so definitely the whole like Bryce, uh, sorry, the, the Brees Hall transition to RB1 is, is definitely taking place. Um, but Carter is still a damn good player. I mean, like th- that shouldn't take anything away from Michael Carter. The, the, the punch between the two of them and what they both bring you, they're both great scheme fits, but they both bring you something different. And that's, that's a nice special tandem that we get to watch for the next few seasons uh, when they're on the rookie contract. So uh, as a whole, I thought the weapons really did a nice job of helping out the young quarterback, which when was the last time you could say that? Really? I mean, like, when was the last time you could say the weapons helped out the young quarterback? Sanchez? <laughs> like, <Probably>. seriously. <laughs> oh, like, yeah, even last yeah, year, I don't think yeah. you could really say that. I mean, maybe the Mike White game against the Bengals last year, you could say the weapons helped him out and he's a young quarterback, but they, the Jets have just not done a good job of assisting young quarterbacks over the last decade, and this was a, it was a good game for the weapons. They, they did a good job, got open, made some big catches. Yeah, they had, they had too many drops in this one, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, the offense really came together those last 10 minutes. You have to be excited. Last yeah, thing and offense... another quickly, oh, yeah, I, another thing I like about the, the weapons, I like the way the ball was spread around. You had four different guys in this game who had a catch yeah. for over 20 yards. So uh, I think they did, Zach did a good job of spreading it around, didn't rely on one guy too much. You know, we saw early last year, he at times was a little too reliant on Davis. Um, but in this game, I think you really saw the versatility of this skill position group kind of kind of come into play and see the value of having multiple guys who can win because you know you can't really lean on one guy sometimes he's not going to be open so you have to have a second option who can win a third option and in this game we really saw that um because you know Corey davis would make the big play then it would be more then it would be wilson and conklin so even carter had a big catch late in the fourth quarter so uh the way the ball spread around is a it's an exciting thing because it, it really helps the consistency of your offense when you have multiple guys you can rely upon. Um, what did you think of LaFleur's performance in this one? They definitely opened up the bag a little bit more with the trick plays. They had the one that obviously they scored the touchdown. We got to see a little Zach Wilson gritty. That was great. But then they had the one later in the game where Zach dropped it. I, I really want to see the all 22 on that. Like, was there somebody just wide open down the field and he took his eye off the ball? Um, bad drop by Zach, but hell of a save man and when you talk about like a natural athlete you remember that video that went like a little bit viral in the preseason or i think it was during the green and white scrimmage where um do you, do you know the video i'm talking about where they like we caught it one-handed yeah he caught it one-handed like yeah. he just stuck his hand up and caught only, it only weirdos like us would remember that well not nah, you had like quite a few retweets it wasn't like just yeah, a I random true <laughs> it was kind of like uh oh he's, he was right on the heels of he's got that dog you remember that too. random four second twitter clip of zach wilson <laughs> catching a ball one-handed in the preseason <laughs> and it wasn't even a game it was the scrimmage yeah of course um he uh but like yeah man he's such a natural athlete you got to give him props i know he dropped the ball which is the easy part of the play but the way that he was just able to scoop it up with one hand like you could just see him tracking it scoop it up with one hand throw it out of bounds. He had a number of those throwaways where it was just like, what the fuck is happening? But quickly on that point, I think there's clearly zero physical questions. He looked like 100% for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The fact that he took that one hit that we were talking about earlier where he landed on his knee all the way bent backwards and he was fine. I think it was the other knee. So I think it was the left knee that he landed on. But still, like, yeah, he, t- he took some shots on this one. But uh, I think holding him out, like, was definitely the right move because – He's making an effort to really use his legs a lot more is at least what I've saw. Like he he's using his athleticism. It doesn't mean he's going to have to run every single play, but he, I just noticed in the pocket, like we saw it a lot in the, uh, the first game against the Panthers. And then I think he got away from a little bit where it was like that pocket movement, that slipperiness, you know what I'm talking about? I think the, the knee injury against the Patriots last year kind of took away some of that. He's talked he's been very vocal about not wanting to wear the brace because he thinks it'll affect his mobility. Um, and I think you saw that last year. Like, he looked way slower with the brace on. Last. Like, even the touchdown he get, had against the Jags, like, he didn't look like the the type of athlete that we know he is. Or the run he had against the Saints where he slid and he had, like, a wide-open 40 yards that he could have maybe ran. 
Um, Zach Wilson without the knee brace. That's a new uh, mythical, uh, uh, new mythical player for the Jets. Knee, uh, knee braceless Zach Wilson because he's quite mobile and quite agile. And I'm excited to see uh, to see what he's able to do. The 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 deep accuracy, like you said, wasn't really there uh, in this one. But the longer he extends those plays, and the more improvisation we see like he's got to do the simple stuff that's all keeps hammering home but you're going to see the Mahomesian magic and I, you started to see it a lot more in this one even if it was like just in throwaways or scooping up random fumbles you kind of got to see some of that magic that everybody saw from him at BYU and that was awesome uh, but what did you think of, of LaFleur's game plan uh, I have to say I really liked it and I obviously the AVT thing I think he deserves uh, some credit for he opened up the trick play bag uh, it is kind of funny that like Lawrence Cager was such a, a vocal point of week one. And he's just been inactive three straight weeks since yeah. um, like this random practice squad tight end. is like, we're going to target him the first five plays of our opening game script. And then it's just like, all right, inactive next three weeks. Um, but you know, I, I like that they're, they're trying things he, he, I like that LaFleur gets creative. He tries things out of the box, whether that's, trying a practice squad converted tight end and starting him, or if that's moving your right guard to left tackle, things are getting weird and, and it's working out for the floor. So, so what did you think for uh, uh, of his performance in this one? Yeah, I think there were a lot of solid things. I think, like you said, being open to moving AVT to left tackle, which I think I saw a post game quote that they asked him, you know, if he was okay yeah. with it, they kind of left it up to him, but you know, just to welcome that possibility is good open-mindedness. So I like that. Um, the trick plays coming back, that was a huge part of the second half last season. You know, the floor was on fire with those. He was creative. They were effective. They always they work. <laughs> yeah, like they worked most of the time, and they were calling probably two two or three of them a game. Um, and we didn't see much of the first three games, but with Zach back, I think you could clearly see some increased confidence in the floor running those plays because, you know, you have a more mobile guy. It really opens up some of the things the Jets did in this game, even like the one Wilson dropped, which granted that's a mistake, but there aren't a lot of guys who are going to clean up that mistake the way he did. So just having a guy with his athleticism and mobility gives you the, the opportunity to do some things like that. And, and there were some good results, you know, such as him catching the touchdown, which worked really well. So uh, there was, I remember last year, there was one where he almost got it. I think it was Miami and Cole threw one that he underthrew. You remember that play? Wilson almost caught a touchdown. Oh, oh, do I remember that play? Yeah, it should have been a TD. It should have been six. Yeah, so they tried that last year, cashed in this time. Uh, so I like the creativity. Um, and they finally got some good balance with between run and pass. You well, know, wait, wait. That... How, how, it was pretty much the same play they ran against the Bucks. And he was talking about the Miami throw that, that they missed, but it, it was the same play with uh, that, that Braxton ran in against the Bucks, right? Oh, Wasn't yeah, it? I think so. Yeah. Because right. Braxton, yeah. Braxton could have ran it in. Uh, on this one too, but he, he threw it to Zach, which was the right move. And also, you know, give us, give his buddy a, a nice touchdown. But uh, I think it was the same play like revert. Yeah, it was like, they had the guy come in motion. They get handed it to Garrett. Garrett flipped it to Braxton and then Braxton could run it or throw it to Zach. So yeah, I think you're right. But you know, that was contract year Barrio. So he's taking that himself. <laughs> now, now that he's, now that he's got his contract, he can share the wealth a little bit. <laughs> It's actually a good point. That's probably, yeah. I mean, it was also, it was also the right move, but yeah, I think the, the, the creativity from the floor is definitely apparent. What did you think about the kind of the hyper conservative approach early on in the game? How, what did you think about kind of the play calling when the offense was stalling in the second and third quarters? And then obviously the end, they had no choice, but to open it up for Zach and, you know, things uh, certainly worked out. Well, I liked early on. They, like I was going to say, they're fine. They finally got a little more, run past balance because you know they got an early lead for once and they got to actually you know, play football the way they wanted to play it um you know run run game wasn't super effective in this one they had a couple of good runs but the run blocking consistency wasn't really there and i'm inter interested to see on film why it wasn't there who some of the culprits were um but i like that they stuck with it and kind of what you know had to balance going because later on i think we saw you know there were some plays where the Steelers really bit hard on some of the Jets run fakes, especially out of shotgun. And it opened up a lot of space in the middle of the field. So I like that they stuck with it and kind of struck some balance. Hopefully it can get more effective going forward with better run blocking, but uh, it was good to see some balance, but I do think they kind of maybe should have went a little more pass heavy late in the game. You know, they did have the one great run with hall to, you know, get them close to the goal line. 
think that was ahead of the day. They had a few. Touchdown. They had a few. I don't. I kind of some solid runs. I, I don't know. I, I feel like there were the run game later on got kind of the frequency of them being stuffed at the line was a little too high. I think they should have went away from it a little bit more, but that was just me. Um, uh, I, could, I, mean, I could see the argument for sticking with it, but it, it kind of felt like the Steelers are really playing the run hard and they weren't consistently running it successfully enough to run it as much as they were. So, and I felt like the passing games kind of getting a good rhythm once that kind of was put into that, heavy throwing modes so, and I was feeling like they maybe should have went away from the run a little bit later on but I, I do like that overall they struck a balance yeah they do seem to operate better as an offense when, when they're throwing the ball but part of just running it is just keeping the defense honest and if, obviously if you can run and have positive yards that's great but keeping them balanced is, is does as much for the passing game than just you know the idea of we want to run um, you saw that uh, in this one, when they started to, they ran the ball a lot and then Zach started to get cooking and then the Steelers started to switch to a two shell look, you know, they started to play more over the top and then that's when Zach did the interception. And then they went back a little bit more towards the run. It, it, I, I think that, like you said, like down the stretch, Zach was really getting cooking with the passing game, but I actually dis I actually like that they kept kind of running the ball and keeping the defense honest um, because the defense had to play the run and they couldn't just try to go all out get after Zach on a blitz or play coverage. Like they had to defend Brees. And um, also they did a really nice job of managing the clock in this one. I think, you know, like we, we talk about it when it's bad and we don't talk about enough of it when it's good, but they did a really, really nice job of, you know, they, they let the clock run down to 18 seconds. They call the timeout. It set them up where it's like, all right, we have an opportunity to run three plays here, you know, or two plays and we can kick the field goal or maybe we'll go for it. But we have all of our timeouts like uh, Sala and company did a really nice job of managing the clock towards the end of that. The, uh, this one, uh, obviously the end of the first half was a bit of a clusterfuck, but they, they helped it with the end of the second half. Uh, what did you, what did you think of the end of that first half? The little momentum swing where it was like, they should be up 13 to three at the very least. They throw it interception. Then the Steelers bomb it deep. And then they, the jets get another interception and they run it back. Uh, for a little bit, and you're like, oh, the Jets going to score. Obviously, he gets tackled after a few uh, laterals. And you're like, all right, end of half. And they're like, oh, wait, never mind. It was uh, roughing the passer. Kind of a weak call, but, you know, it gets called nowadays. Um, puts the Steelers kind of in field goal range. They bomb a 59-yarder. And they it's like – that was like the feeling entering halftime. I was like, oh, that shouldn't have happened. Um, so what did you think about that whole sequence of events? Obviously, they, they rebounded. But your mood at halftime was <laughs> was pretty low. But then they, they fought through. And, they, and they, so now that we're at a win, looking back at that little sequence, uh, what were your thoughts on it? Uh, I mean, that was pretty rough. I think I think if they ended up losing this game, that was the stretch you would look back on as why they lost it. I mean, despite how the second half went, I think the way the first half was playing out, the Jets really should have been able to translate it to the scoreboard more than they did because I think 10-6 at halftime didn't reflect how that first half was going and, and that's not to say the Jets were you know dominating or anything because they did have some drives that didn't really go anywhere but you know with the way the field position was flipping the Jets had plenty of opportunities to put points up and the fact that you know they had the opportunity to to double up to score at the end of the half and get it back to start the second um, that late half sequence was a difference maker because even if you know Zach doesn't throw that first interception you at least hit that field goal, hopefully put it at 13, three, don't give up the field goal going back. And, you know, now it's 10 points going into halftime. That's a six point swing compared to what actually happened, which turned out to be a huge difference maker. So the interception, which we talked about, not a good play, you know, just the play in itself and then the situation. Um, and, th and then coming back, I think, you know, some people were critical of Carl Lawson. Some people weren't, I'm on his side here. I don't, I think that was a, soft call I don't think there's a lot he could have done to avoid that it, it was one of those where he's kind of already in the process of moving towards the quarterback while he's releasing it it's not a ton he could do to stop himself so I, I thought that was just kind of a tough break not really a bad play and and some penalties the Jets have had recently are bad plays you know the Corey Davis one last week that was a really bad penalty that you have control over this one I think they kind of got a bad break but either way it was still a and then he makes, you know, the field goal they made is the longest one in the history of the stadium. So that's kind of a tough break too. But either way, it definitely was a rough swing to close the half there. 
All right, let's talk about um, the defense. We focused entirely on the offense, but it was the defense that really needed a, a nice performance and a nice bounce back. I started them in fantasy this week, Michael. I had a feeling. I was just like, you know what? Whether it's Trubisky or the rookie quarterback and Kenny Pickett, his defensive line is angry about last week. They didn't get after the quarterback. You know, the secondary has the ability to create takeaways. I think this game was kind of indicative of what you w- imagine this defense looking like, where it's like, all right, they're going to give up yards. This is not a defense that's built to be a, a, a stalwart. This defense is built to make the big plays, to win on third down, which they haven't done at all, actually. But in this one, they did come up big on third down. They were creating those drive wrecking sacks. Or, and they had to create plenty of turnovers. I think they had four interceptions, five if you count the one at the end of the half that got called back, so you can't. But four interceptions, three sacks, a ton of pressures, a ton of, of, of great pass breakups and tackles for losses. And just the idea of this defense is, look, like they're going to get yards. We're going to make the big plays. We'll hold up well in the red zone. Um, and you just want to have the every drive. Like if you can get that one drive-breaking play where it's like even a sack, on first down and now it's second and 17, you know, that's what this defense is predicated on. And, and I think they, uh, they did a night, nice, uh, you know, they brought Bryce Huff in. He did a nice job creating some pressures. They played JFM a little bit more inside. He's still the starting defensive end, which is okay. Like he can do that, but I, I liked that they were not keeping him out on the edge as much. Again, like you said, we got to go back and watch because during the game, it's hard to keep track of, of personnel that much, but it did seem like he was playing on inside a little bit more, especially on third downs. Still saw plenty of rotation. Uh, I'd be curious to see the numbers if it's the same or if they dial it back a little bit. But um, as a whole, I thought this defense rebounded quite nicely. Uh, I thought they had a nice start, obviously. Then the whole momentum of pick coming in, like you said, it's like it was like that 2018 game against Cleveland all over again. It's like, oh, here comes the rookie quarterback and they're at home and all the fans are going crazy and the Jets are letting this one slip away. And uh, and this defense kept fighting. They made plenty of plays that play with three and a half minutes to go. I mean, at the time, like you said, I almost didn't realize how big it was Steelers on the jets 35 yard line and saw some Michael Carter make that play. They get that interception and that sets everything up in, in motion for, for the game winning drive. So this defense really came up big when it mattered. And that's, that's what it's predicated on. And I think it was the first game that you really saw it happen. Maybe outside of the, uh, the Browns Ashton Davis interception, uh, to close that one out. So that was my little brief summary on the defense. Michael, what did you see from the defense and, and how encouraged were you from, from the performance we saw? Obviously the Steelers, not that impressive, but they still do have plenty of, of good players. They're well coached. They have a solid off. Well, I don't know if I should say they have a solid offensive line, but they're a well coached offensive line that they're, they're, you know, they have a good offensive line coach and the rookie quarterback came in, they had momentum. So even though they're not maybe the most talented team in the world, this is still a team that is, uh, it's a, a team that very well could have beaten the Jets today. You know, it's a team that that will win games this year. And, and like you said, playing in Pittsburgh is as tough as anywhere. So uh, how, how did you feel like the, the defense came up? Yeah, this is definitely the most impressive performance from the defense this year. And, and, and granted, like you said, it's not the most impressive opponent they're playing. I think the quarterback play was pretty bad aside from a couple good plays from Kenny Pickett. I mean, Trubisky was, really terrible there was one play on third down where he the Jets got a third down stop because Carter second Carter the second stopped the play short of the sticks but it was just because Trubisky threw it behind the guy and kind of cost them the first down so uh, granted not the best opponent but I think they still did a good job maximizing that because one of the keys I had going into this game was I thought they should not blitz often against this team because you know, I, I mean, obviously Pickett ended up playing half this game, but Trubisky, his splits coming into this game over the first three weeks, he was really bad against non-blitzing, on non-blitzing plays against four rushers or fewer. And then against the blitz, he's actually pretty solid. So I thought the Jets should play into that, and they did end up doing that. Um, according to Next Gen Stats, they only blitzed on two plays out of the 29 passing plays that the Steelers had and and that worked out really well because those four man rushes got home a few times for uh three sacks and then you know throwing against it Trubisky just couldn't navigate the traffic and obviously Pickett struggled with it a little bit as well so um so I do think the game plan was really good and they I don't want to say finally game plan to the opponent because I think the Ravens they actually did do a pretty good job last two weeks 
not the best, but this game, I think they did, you know, great. Even though the opponent was weak, they did their best job to make sure they stayed weak by playing to their weaknesses. So I think the game planning was good. Um, Pass rush, solid game. You know, they came up with some big plays. I don't think it was incredibly consistent. You know, there were some clean pockets, but they came up with big plays when they needed them, you know, three sacks, they had uh, six quarterback hits in this game. So pretty solid pressure. I think they're still capable of even better, but uh, they did have some big plays in, in timely spots um, with Jermaine getting a sack, Carl Lawson, Quinnen, you know, the guys you want to be stepping up, stepped up in, in big spots. Uh, and then Huff, like you said, uh, I don't think played much in this game, but he po- popped out when he was out there. I think he did have some key pressures. Uh, there was one pressure on third down where he helped to force an incompletion. I specifically remember that one. Um, so I think he made an impact. Um, overall, it's a good defensive game. And also the run game. I think the run defense was solid. You know, this is a Steelers run game that has not been effective this year. Um, and, and once again, the Jets made sure that continued to happen. You know, just because you're playing a weak opponent doesn't guarantee anything. You have to make sure that they – you know, continue to struggle. And and like you said, it's also a well-coached team. So I'm sure they had, you know, a good knowledge of this defense and how to exploit it. But, you know, the Jets are ready and played a really nice defensive game. Um, And I know the Steelers put up 20 by the end of the game, but one of those touchdown drives was gift wrapped by the interception. So essentially they only really scored, you know, had three or 13 points that were actually earned fully on the defense. So it, it was a really good defensive performance. I think that uh, Bryce Huff was playing. I mean, I have to go back and watch, but from what I saw from at least early in the game, Huff was coming in with the starting defensive line on third downs. Whereas like, you know, like they have the, the backup defensive line that comes in way too much of, um, of Jacob Martin, Nathan Shepard, Solomon Thomas, and Jermaine Johnson. And sometimes Michael Clemens comes in there too if, for, for Jacob Martin, if it's more of a rundown or whatever. And this one, when they wanted to go third down, keep the starters in, big pass rush, they would go Carl Lawson, Quinnen, JFM, Bryce Huff. They had they had plenty of, uh, of reps w- with Rankins still in when the starters were in. But on third down, Huff came in, Rankins went out, JFM went inside, and that was definitely the right move because um, they were creating a lot more pressure. And like we said last week, they were getting to the quarterback faster because they had more speed on the field. They were creating more chaos. They were able to chase. Um uh, I'm really happy with how the defensive line played. It wasn't maybe the, I shouldn't say I'm really happy because it wasn't the, there were times in this one where you're like, God, this defensive line's not getting uh, as much pressure as they yeah, should, but yeah. they did, they did end up coming through making enough plays in the end. So you have to be happy with, with how they played. And it is kind of funny that like Jermaine Johnson first round pick that they traded up for had a sack in this one. And he's not even, he, he almost feels like a third round pick because of all the young talent that the jets have. Like he's so buried on uh, young studs that we want to talk about. But yeah, Jermaine having exactly the type of season that I think we kind of hope for. And you, you texted me this to me as well. What have you kind of thought of, of Jermaine Johnson's first four games? Because he really doesn't get talked about a lot, but he, to me, is is setting himself quite setting himself up quite nicely for, for a breakout next year. Because, you know, Ricky Edge guys, they struggle often and then they break out maybe year two or year three. The fact that you're seeing this already from Jermaine He's inconsistent, but he's he's making those flash plays. What, what have you seen from Jermaine over the first four weeks? Uh, yeah, I think he's kind of been very close to at least what I was expecting from him. You know, run defense has been very good. I think his college tape and his build and his athleticism kind of suggested that he would be ready to do that right away. Um, it was the pass rushing consistency that you wondered, okay, does he have enough moves? Does he have enough um, just feel for pass rushing to – be able to win consistently but i think in spite of that you also looked at those tools he has and figured okay he's going to make splash plays every now and then maybe not he's not going to be a pressure machine to start out but you could definitely see him making a sack every now and then and just making big plays that show you that talent that he could be a superstar eventually when he puts it all together and i think that's what we've seen you know i don't think he's one at a super great you know, level of consistency, but, you know, he had a sack against the Ravens. Uh, He got a half sack on that one, but that was really all him. Um, And then he gets a sack in this one as part of a three-man rush. So Damn good um, rep, too. Yeah, it was a great rep. So 
Uh, so yeah, I think that's what we're seeing. You know, splash plays every now and then that remind you, okay, yeah, this guy is really talented. Um, and then once he does get the consistency down, he does have the potential to to be a star pass rusher. But in the meantime, while he works on that, the run defense is is reliable, and, and that's huge for a team that doesn't have a ton of guys who are run defense specialists. Well, but the fact that they have a guy like him, who's quote unquote in the pipeline of talent. It's just so wild to me. The Jets have just not had that. And like, yeah, they've had a lot of picks and they rotate the defensive line, whatever. But the fact that they have a guy of Jermaine Johnson's caliber, who's not really a star, he isn't a starter. Um, he's getting sacks. He's making plays. He's setting himself up the, you know, I'm, I'm very excited to see how he develops throughout the season. Cause like you said, like, is he that consistent yet? No. Is he the superstar pass rusher out of the gates? No, but he's making plays and he's doing a lot more than, than most, uh, Edge, rookie edge players in his position do i mean unless you're like a top 10 pick a lot of times those rookies especially like a 4-3 defensive end a big you know like micah parsons was an off-ball linebacker who was rushing the ball the, the passer and now he's playing a little bit more of edge and stuff like that's a little different but like a 4-3 defensive end going up against nfl offensive tackles to come out of the gates and at least do anything is is impressive and and I, i've liked what i've seen from him and and not just the pass game, like you said, but it's it's the run game too. Like he, he's been stout in that area. The uh, the position group that I really want to give a shout out and I really want to talk about the safeties. Yes, they have gotten so much shit, well deserved over the first three weeks of the season. They've been terrible, really, really bad part of this defense. Uh, this one, a lot different, a lot different takeaways, big breakups, nice run stops, good angles. Um, I'm sure it wasn't all perfect. I watched the L22 for the seventh time in this podcast. We'll say that, but uh, Joyner made that huge breakup at the start of the game and then got the interception on the next drive. He had two of them because he had the, the one right at the end of the game. Whitehead had a pick and had another one at the end of the half that got called back. I mean, both of them made play after play, and you kind of got a taste of what this defense is supposed to look at, uh, look like uh, at, at times during this game. Oh, yeah, this was a huge bounce back game. From the safeties, uh, really from start to finish, you know, Joyner comes through with the early interception on the second Pittsburgh drive and then closes out the game with the Hail Mary interception. But but yeah, they are fantastic. And Joyner, even before the first interception he had, he had a fantastic pass breakup on that opening drive uh, by Pittsburgh uh, on a pass to Pickens that really easily could have been completed. So from the very beginning, Joyner was locked in in this game and then whitehead as well joins in with a great game of his own and obviously they both teamed up on that one interception by Pickett uh throwing it deep i think it was yeah joiner tipped it and then whitehead came up with it so um great game by this duo you always have to give credit where it's due you know first three games this duo really struggled joiner was i think a lot of people would agree he was maybe their worst starter and whitehead hasn't played up to expectations but in this game and, and I said, I posted in a tweet earlier, they were the MVPs of this game. I think, you know, you look at who played the best from start to finish. It was definitely, I think this pair. So very encouraging. If the jets can get some more of that from them going forward, you're not going to get three interceptions a game out of these guys, but you know, if they could just be, just be as confident as they were at just being in the right place at the right time, even if you don't pick it every single time, just, you know, preventing those big plays, um, you know, you think back to that Ravens game. Here's a here's a fun hypothetical. If the Jets get this performance from Whitehead and Joyner against the Ravens, you think they could have won that game? Maybe a 10-7, 9-6 kind of game? If they got that type of performance and Zach played, yeah. Well, they could have won that game. Like, I mean, you think the all Bengals three and Ravens. touchdowns the Ravens got were on third down against one of these two guys, and they were deep touchdowns. Yeah. So if they, they played this game – you know, I don't know. I don't know if the Ravens offense would have done much else because that's kind of the only weakness. Well, that's like you keep calling the, the, the Ravens and the Bengals games blowouts. And like, yeah, they weren't good. <laughs> it's somewhere you know. in between a blowout and a close loss, like a, a middle yeah. ground. Yeah, there's a middle ground there where it's like that was very – you know what it was? It was close to being a close loss is how the, both those games felt. Like yeah. they were a play away from that being – or even like the Bengals game last week where it was like they're driving, 10 minutes to go. If they punch this in, it's a single possession game. Like very similar to this week. Whereas like if – let's say go back to the, the, uh, the driver Corey Davis scored the touchdown in the fourth quarter. 
Um, cause didn't they, 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 that's right. They had the Brees Hall run where we thought was a touchdown. They said he was out and then they got the penalty. Like, let's say that gets pushed back or whatever. And then the jets kick a field goal and then the, the Steelers score or whatever. You'd be like, is that a blowout? You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I don't know. Both those Ravens, obviously this game was different cause the jets were, had a lead for a lot of the game and, and blew it and then came back. But, um, both the Ravens and Bengals games, like I felt like were ugly losses, but they weren't like the earth shattering losses that they were presented as um, kind of, it's hard. I'll mention it for the eighth time in this podcast. It's hard without seeing the all 22, but CJ Mosley, I'm curious to get your thoughts. I, I think that, you know, maybe Thursday is a better time after we've seen the all 22 to give like more thoughts on, on the guys like first four games of the year. Like we're kind of at like a nice little quarter break four games in two and two Mosley to me is somebody that I, I'm curious to go back and watch in this one, because I feel like a few times this season, like, look, he's still the instinctual veteran. He'll make his plays. He's not a bad football player, but I think you're seeing Mosley get beat a few more times this season. And and I saw it. I noticed it a few more times in this one, uh, especially early on. What have you thought of, of Mosley season so far? Is he kind of going under the radar this year as, as a guy who's underperforming? In this game, it was definitely pretty rough. But I think first three games, you know, he had some ups and downs. This one, though, from the start, I think he was standing out pretty frequently. He gave up a lot of catches to Friar Muth. Um, he had some missed tackles in the run game. Uh, this was a rough one for him. And, I uh, I mean, like you said, we should honestly name our rename the podcast to that. Got to watch the All-22. <laughs> that could be our, our alternate podcast name or something like that yeah, cool you, cool uh, your jets until you watch the all 22 that's the full yeah, name of in, per, in parentheses so yes. we'll rename it to that but uh but i don't even think you need to rewatch it to know that mosley was pretty bad in this one i, I think he was probably the only aspect of the defense that kind of consistently stood out as not playing too well so uh, i don't know you you have bad games sometimes as linebacker i don't think the first three games were were too bad i would say they were he was above average, so we'll see if he can bounce back. This was a rough one, though. You think uh, – how did you feel Quan filled in for, for Quincy? He had that one I massive him. hit. Yeah. Yeah, I think Quan had some – he had he's some big a, he's hits. He's been a huge addition to this defense. He's been really solid, I think. The range that he's brought, I think he's – he's made some plays where, you know, he gets over there quickly, and if he doesn't get there, then maybe that run goes a little bit further. And just, like, the power of the hits – that he brings, I feel like it injects some energy to the defense, kind of brings a little bit of an intimidation factor. So, yeah, he's he's been very solid. Yeah, and you were kind of worried about losing that with Quincy getting injured because um, a lot of times he's the guy who comes flying in and makes some crazy hit, and you're like, Jesus. Um, and Quan has done that a few times this year. He had but a really it, clutch play, I think, in the fourth quarter. I forget what it was, but I remember a play where it's like, that was big. Let's go, Quan. I forget yeah. what it was. All right. But, Got, Great got to analysis. watch 22. <laughs> yeah, sick analysis. <laughs> um, I think the cornerbacks, I'm just trying to run through the defense here. There's like other guys that we want to talk about before we get out of here. Cornerbacks, another fucking great game. I don't know why I dropped the F bomb there. I'm trying to try to save that for, <laughs> for, for emphasis. <laughs> another fucking great game for the corners. Uh Sauce and DJ <laughs> and Michael Carter the second. How do you uh how'd you feel from them? I think the corners also had a really good game. The safeties have taken the attention because it was unusual for them to play well, but I think at this point we're just getting used to the corners being good, so we don't really talk about it. But Sauce Gardner showed up again. Another another think, pass breakup down the field. Another pass breakup down the field. I think I saw a stat somewhere they're crediting him for no catches on three targets. Um, <laughs> contributed to that Carter the second interception. Uh, granted, me and you just watched it. I think it kind of went off the guy's hands so he didn't really he, he, he had, it, he but he was good, there he was he had good position he, he, he had good position he, uh, you know made it a difficult catch I, th- I think that second. i think he could being there making the dive was impressive i think he could have broken that up even if that didn't bounce off friar yeah. hands like he, sauce was in the perfect position to rip that ball out when he was coming down with it um so yeah the, you, have, you have to give sauce some credit on that but the, yeah that was that was michael carter the second stabbing interception so and also dj reed kind of you didn't even notice him in this game which no. Generally is a very good thing for a corner. And he continues to just rack up the reps without giving up much of anything. So corners on this team are really looking like a strength for sure. And then we saw in this game when the safeties actually join them and play well, like, Ooh, this is a secondary. Yeah. And it's like, hopefully you're hopeful that if, if 
if this coaching staff is as forward thinking as you'd hope it would be, they'll look at this defense. If they're struggling, you know, there's going to be more, there'll be plenty of more seasons over gloom and doom weeks coming in the next few weeks when the jets get blown out by the bills or they lose to whoever, and you'll have all the reactionaries coming out. Um, but you'd hope that this Jets coaching staff will look at the play of the corners and say, look, these guys are winning. This defensive line has been up and down. We can put more on the backs of our, our corners. I know you want to run this defense through your defensive line, but the way these corners are playing man up sauce one-on-one. And then that maybe that frees up the other 10 guys to play faster and more in space. And you're going to trust sauce one-on-one because it's gotten to the point with sauce and like, look, he'll give up plays and whatever. But when the ball is thrown deep down the field before sauce, it's like, Oh God, Oh God. Oh God. Here comes a touchdown. But when that ball gets launched up into the air and you don't really know what's happening, the camera's still panning over and then it comes down and I see that lanky number one Jersey stride for stride with the number for the team's number one receiver. I'm like, Oh, that's getting broken up. Like that's the level of confidence we're getting at with sauce. Where it's like, they throw that ball up. I see that one Jersey. I'm like, Oh, that's a, that's a pass breakup or an interception. Yeah. Um, Cause he's so filthy. Um, and his technique and the way that he's just able to break passes up at the last minute is, is just really so- – and, and also the way that he's able – and this is something Revis was really, really good at, not to throw out just like that comparison this early on, but Revis was really good at the uh, getting physical. He could get grabby a little bit, that, that, that physical contact without drawing the flag, and I think you've seen that from Sauce. Like he had that breakup of Chase last week. Um, which looks sick. And then you look at the replay and you can see, oh, he's, he's holding the uh, the inside shoulder or the outside shoulder uh, jersey a little bit, just gives it a little tug and then gets his hand in there. Like the nuances of, of, of how he's able to get that contact in and get physical, not just at the line, but as, when the ball's in the air um, is really impressive for a rookie. And it's something that you've seen the best corner in Jets history was, was really good at. And Revis was not a guy who got flagged that often, but he was one of the most physical corners out there. Um, so that's exciting. I don't think we've even seen a it'll come because he, he does get grabby, but I don't think we've seen a sauce holding or PI penalty. Man, yeah, no, wrong about that? he has no, no penalty so far. So, you know what? I, I, you have to be in love with how the corners play have, have been playing great bounce back week for, for the safeties, the linebackers still probably need a, another injection this off season of like speed and, and talent there but Quan is, is playing well. When Quincy gets back, he'll get more speed in the field. And, and CJ is that, that wily veteran uh, who, who knows where the ball's going. Seems like a, every play. And then the defense knows line, where it's like, going, but sometimes can't get there. <laughs> knows where it's going, but sometimes to yell to, for somebody else to go and tackle him because those knees aren't holding up anymore. Um, but no, I'm, I'm just kidding. I think CJ, honestly, he's, he's, he's the heart and soul of this team. Every time I listen to his, his pregame speeches, I get, I get amped up. Um, and he's still a damn good football player. Um, and then a the defensive line, you know, you, you hope that they, I feel like I'm still seeing way too much Nathan Shepard, but, <laughs> but outside of that, I think, uh, you have to be happy with how the defense played. So overall, man, you know, special teams always gets, uh, the, the rub on this pod, but Braid man, another nice game. I think the onside kick has given him a, a boost in his confidence. Cause now he's really just letting that thing fly. I don't think he's, he's really letting that thing fly. Like he's got, he had his big moment. So now the fans are kind of on his side again. And now it seems like he's not as I uh, I don't know. It's a two game sample size where the jets haven't punted like crazy, but I don't know. Uh, and then Zerline, had a good game. That first punt he had was really good. Yeah. And Zerline uh, been very consistent uh, besides that first miss to open up the year. He's been very consistent, which is awesome. Uh, the jets still can't fall on a fumble <laughs> to save their life. Even one <laughs> as easy as this one. Well, I will say offensively, they did a nice job falling on the fumbles this one because they had the one on the, the game-winning touchdown that didn't matter because he was, he was crossing the plane and, and the Jets recovered. And then the one we talked about earlier was Zach scooped it up. But, um, excuse me, uh, but uh, defensively and special team-wise, they still cannot fall on a fumble. So I don't know what that's about. Yeah, got to work on some ball recovery drills. Yeah. Didn't they used to do that with, uh, was it Bowles or Rex who would like dunk the balls in water and then like, I'm trying to remember what. I'm trying sounds to... like more of a Rex thing. That than does, a sounds, thing. That's a, sounds on brand for Rex. Um, all right. Well, I think. Is there anything else? Anything else we want to touch on here? Any more Zach? Con- I know there's. We're gonna hang up, Michael, and then we'll talk for like another 15 minutes, and it'll be fuck. I wish I said that in the podcast. So, while I, while I uh, get the outro ready, not that there's anything to get ready, but um, is there anything else? 
I know we're going to talk about the uniforms after uh, we do the whole plugs and we'll be like, last thoughts. You'll talk about the unis. But yep. in terms of game <laughs> we content, know how this goes by this point. In terms of game content, is there anything, any other topics you want to dive into before we get out of here? Um, I think, what was I going to bring up? Uh, oh, yeah, I think the, the, oh, yeah, the in the backfield, I think we're kind of seeing, and we talked about it a little bit, but um, I think we're sort of seeing Brees Hall kind of getting that edge over Carter a little bit. Yeah. Um, last couple of weeks, he's taken the advantage in the playing time. In this game, Hall played a season high. Uh, I think it was 65 snaps I saw it. Um, but I think Carter also saw his go down. So, uh, And also we mentioned the carry, 17 to 9 in favor of Hall. So, uh, oh, just got the snap count here. 67% for Hall. That's a season high. Beats his 61 from the previous game. And then Carter in this game down to... 43 so kind of been trending in Brees Hall's direction a little bit um so potentially he's uh, I don't think we're ever going to see like anything drastic like this might be the extent of it for now but it does seem like he's kind of taking the edge a little bit Brees yeah Brees is definitely coming on uh I'm excited to see as the as the weather gets colder um how he gets cooking um because he does seem like every week he's getting more and more comfortable uh and he's He's running in between the tackles uh, pretty well, I have to say. I think that he's doing a better job of getting skinny and getting through that that initial burst. Whereas, like the in the, in the preseason and maybe the first week or whatever, it felt like he was kind of he wasn't able to push through uh, the, the closing holes as as well as he is now. But he's doing a better job of just getting skinny and, and sliding through. And that's the thing; like these guys get better every single week, especially for a young team. They, they get more reps than they get in a training camp, basically, in one game. Well, that's not true. But, like, you know, more meaningful reps in one NFL game than they have a whole week of breaking down the film and talking about it a whole nother week of practice and preparing for another opponent. And they're back on the field. And so for a young team, like, they're just getting reps. And every single game, you're just hoping to see that development. And you're definitely seeing it from a guy like Brees Hall. And you hope to keep seeing it from guys like Jermaine and, and guys like like Michael Clemens or Jeremy Ruckert or well Max Mitchell when he was healthy and, and guys like that, like you want to just keep seeing the growth of this young team. And, and I think, you know, for so long, it feels like for so pretty much since 2019, since Douglas came in, we've been kind of sold. We've been buying in on the jets on the potential of, of what they're building. And then it was like the whole Gase years really sucked. And then they bring in Salah and it's like, you know, they're really going to turn this around. And last year it's like, okay, well they got a young team. They're not going to be, um, they're not going to be competitive. We're just trying to hope for them to develop or whatever. And then this year, you really want to see them take that step. And the fact that they're going to get out of the first four weeks at two and two needed some luck against Cleveland, got a little unlucky at times, but at the uh, overall, I think you have to be very excited with, with how this team has yeah. started. And that's why it's just so important to watch these games with just the perspective of like, of just zooming out and being like, you know, it's, it's one game. We got, you know, 17 of them this year. Um, and so when you look at the first four games as a whole, I think it gives you a better picture of what this team is. So, um, where is it quickly? uh, Are you going to go? You had something to finish up? No, not, not really. Go ahead. Okay. Well, quickly on the young talent. I just think like, how cool is it that we get to see these guys, these young guys making meaningful clutch game winning plays in, in games that matter. Like yeah, Garrett, Garrett Wilson and, has a yeah. game winning touchdown. Brees Hall has a game winning touchdown. Yeah. Just think think back to two years ago when our hope Frank of Gore. young talent was like, <laughs> oh yay, P Ryan scored a five run touchdown in a 30 point loss to the Bills. Oh yay, Mims had a couple of deep catches in a 40 point loss to the Chiefs. <laughs> now we're seeing these guys making game winning plays on the road against yeah. you know the Steelers, against a good Browns team. Like this is the stuff of dreams. It's a fun team. Awesome. It's a fun team. Are they going to win the Super Bowl this year? No. Uh, could they make the playoffs? They could They could make a second half playoff push. I don't think that's, I mean, I'm not saying they will, but it's it's in the cards. If they're four or five at the bye, they got a lot of winnable games. If they come back focused after the bye and they're really clicking, like they could make a push. But for me, it's just like, you just want to see them be competitive, get around 500, seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 wins like you kind of want to be around there and uh i think you're seeing that team really push for that it's a fun team man like even when they lose i'm like just the level of young talent that we get to watch and enjoy um it, it's special it, it's fun to watch so uh they got a big game this this week 
Michael, you're coming back to the city. We're going to go to the yep. game, our, our second game together, unless we count the Pats game we didn't sit at uh, last year, but um, sit together with. Uh, last year, you were at, we were at the game together, but not really. So this will be the second one. Hopefully, we have better luck. Um, I, I haven't seen the Jets win in person yet, but I did. I, we count, if you count the Giants preseason game this year, I have seen them win. So I'm hoping that maybe we can. Can I at least see a touchdown? Like the, la- the yeah, last few, I, I guess I saw – like a, a touchdown in the first quarter would be nice. Cause I saw that we went to the Ravens game without, you know, I was fun for a little bit, but it was like rainy. The energy wasn't really there. Like, you know, then the Pats game last year, which was awful. <laughs> Zach Wilson throwing like four interceptions, yeah. his first 10 passes game before that I went to was, uh, well, I went to the Bengals game this year, but uh, the, the game before that I went to was uh, the seeing ghost game. Like I've just had a, a stretch of just ugly games. Um, so hopefully we can turn that around back of quarterback facing Teddy, two gloves. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I got to play my part, like a, a very important trend kind of continued this week. So on the season now, the jets are two and oh, when I wear a Jersey that matches the color they're wearing. <laughs> so obviously they wore white in every game. So, uh, against Cleveland, I wore my white more Jersey today. I wore my white Wilson Jersey. So that's two and oh, right there. Two home games, though, I switched it up and I didn't match the theme. I wore my green JFM jersey to the Ravens game. And then uh, against the Bengals, I wore my black Carl Lawson jersey Mm. because it was his revenge game. And they lost both of those. So I got to stick with the theme. Yeah, I'm going to blame you then. Uh, What did you think of the I got to say, I really liked the uh, the white, the white jersey, black pant combo. It looked a lot better than it did last year. I, the dome game against I did honestly I didn't really like the look last year against the, the Colts, but uh but I thought it was a really clean uniform matchup this week. It always looks better when you win, but I thought that entering the game too. No, oh, yeah, it, it was great this week. I kind of anticipated that because you know, Colts game, I don't think it was the best time for it because it was a little weird there because the Colts are blue and white. There's not they were all blue no, that game. No black in their in their color scheme at all. So it's Kind of a weird matchup, but in Pittsburgh, plenty of black on Steelers uniforms in the stadium. I think it kind of worked well with against the Steelers. So you no, know, you'd think you'd be some fashionista, and then I see Michael, and he's wearing like these Adam Gase baggy sweatshirt <laughs> from like the 2019 Jets sideline apparel, and I'm like, dude, what's going on here? You've got good taste, Michael. Talking about the the color schemes balancing off each other. All right. You can follow us at TYJ Pod on Twitter, Michael, Michael underscore Nania, myself, Ben W. Blessington. Go to jetsxfactor.com, best place to go for Jets content. Rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. Uh, subscribe to Jets X Factor on YouTube. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, my, oh, we just did the uniform talk. So, Michael, any last, last, last thoughts? We should be consulted when they inevitably come up with new uniforms oh, again bro, I, please who talks about uniforms more than we do <laughs> that's all you can talk about when nobody the, it's all you can talk about when the team sucks but the the better they get the the uh the less we'll talk about the uniforms and the better these ones will look i mean that's just the, the rams are the the perfect case study in it they have the they had the worst uniforms when they announced them and then they won a super bowl and now they're kind of cool looking you know so it's like you know the jets winning these the the perception of them will Keep keep moving in the the positive direction, but I can't wait for those Kelly Green throwbacks. Because I was watching the uh, bit of the Giants game, because I was at a sports bar watching this, and uh, those Giants throwbacks with the red end zones. I gotta say, the Giants the Giants did it right this year with their throwbacks. So I'm looking forward to the Kelly Green '80s logo throwback unis next year. That's gonna be exciting. Also, Patriots are in last place. The Jets have a better record than the Patriots Let's go! for the first time in ten years. Dude, it's a good time. This this Dolphins game should have been for first place in the AFC East oh, if, uh, if the Ravens, the Ravens held on. could have held on. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Well, we who, still. Who we, the Bills play next week? We Got to keep hope alive. No idea. I'm looking it up. Oh, Steelers. It's in <laughs> yeah, Buffalo. Well, that, so that's, that's a blowout. Happen. Uh, well, still. All right. Second place hey, still, in the AFC East dude, is on the line. It doesn't matter. It's too early in the season to even care, but the Jets are uh, in the thick of it, you know, and uh, Dolphins are a damn good team a tough team a team that's had 10 days to prepare for them you know mcdaniel's smart as hell and he, and he, hail <laughs> smart as hell <laughs> what was that? You, <laughs> sometimes sometimes when i'm talking right i get a little sudden <laughs> play. um but uh yeah i mean it, it, he's, he has experience he knows the solid defense it's gonna be a really as hail <laughs> hail uh it's uh it'll be a really interesting game but on thursday or we're recording it thursday on f- friday 
our preview pod for that game will come out. I will make sure that the audio gain is, is lower. So we're not uh, screaming in the, I was listening to it and we, I was listening and like Michael would talk and be like, yeah, you know, I think the jets in this game. And then I come on and it would, I'm not going to do it because I'll wake up <laughs> my neighbors, but it was just like the difference in the audio quality. I was like, God damn it. Uh, so we'll make sure it's uh, the audio. Hopefully the audio quality was a little better in this one. We've had some issues. You didn't have your mic for two weeks and the audio game was off last week, but we're getting it together. We're working out the kinks early in the season, but uh Thank you to everybody for listening. As I said, we'll be back on Friday previewing that Dolphins game. My Jets dub. Enjoy these weeks. They're few and far between, and it feels great. Victory Monday feels great. Enjoy it, everybody. We'll be back on Friday. Go Jets.